Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Brigadier General Tim Cadavy, and as I said before, uh, Deputy Director for the Army National Guard. I think uh, maybe it's appropriate because of the number of uh, allied officers we have in the, the group to, to maybe uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the United States Army Reserve and the United States Army National Guard. Uh, the Army National Guard uh, serves under two distinct uh, federal statuses, uh, Title 32 and Title 10. Uh, Title 32 is a federal status in which, under which uh, soldiers in the Army National Guard serve when they're not mobilized. Uh, this is when they are, are drilling back at their home stations. Uh, they're one weekend a month. They're, they're 15 days uh, annual training. And I think the key thing to, to understand about Title 32 is that even though it is a federal status, uh, the soldiers and the units are under the command and control of the governor of their respective states, which gives the governor of that state a capacity and capability uh, to respond to emergencies, uh, whether, they ma whether they're man-made or natural, uh, with some type of military capability. And then under Title 10, uh, that's the uh, capacity in which our, our soldiers serve under the code uh, for overseas uh, operations, uh, mobilizations, uh, etc. So essentially the president is then once again uh, the commander-in-chief and, and uh, the governors uh, relinquish that command and control once a unit is, is mobilized. Those are the, the two uh, distinct differences in the statuses. Uh, in the last nine years the Army National Guard has truly moved from a strategic reserve to part of the operational force. And I think uh, two facts uh, that really uh, highlight this. First, since September 11th, uh, 2001, the Army National Guard has mobilized approximately 430,000 uh, man days. Now, I say man days rather than soldiers because uh, many of our soldiers have been mobilized uh, twice, three times, and within that, uh, it's additive. And then of our total 362,000 so soldiers currently uh, assigned to the Army National Guard, 59% have been mobilized or deployed uh, previously. Now, as I talked about a strategic reserve to part of the operational force, uh, at 2001 and, and up to uh, approximately 2003, 2004, the Army Guard had used uh, tiered readiness. And it was primarily focused on uh, what many in this room recall as force packages. And in the, and in the, uh, the case of the Army National Guard, we had enhanced separate brigades uh, that were that were that were uh, at a higher level level of readiness received additional resources than our divisional brigades at the time, and we managed those through what we called managed levels of resources. And what it did is those units that were identified as force packages uh, to support the two MTW uh, plans or the enhanced separate brigades were at a higher level of resourcing within the Army National Guard, which meant they had a higher number of full-time support. Uh, they had over strength, so higher end strength uh, than, than what their force structure called for. Uh, they had higher levels of equipment on hand. They had more modernized equipment, and they received additional op tempo dollars to execute uh, higher levels of training. And then uh, lastly, uh, they received a higher percentage of AC training support. And then as we, we worked through those managed levels of resources, the way we graded ourselves was through the unit status report, uh, the, the monthly report sent by units to the Department of the Army, and we, we focused on C ratings. And primarily, uh, as we got into this, this overseas contingency operation uh, in, the, in the name theaters of operation, what we had developed over the years prior to that were what we called the haves and the have-nots, those that were resourced at higher levels and, and those that, that were not. Uh, two, two things uh, we found out very early is one that uh, the OCO requirements exceeded our tiered readiness units. So what it meant is we were going to have to go into our less ready units in the Army National Guard in order to support uh, the demand, as General Graham talked about it earlier. And, and the second thing, uh, that we saw very early on is that the units, the first units that were, were called or mobilized right after 9-11 were not these FSP units or these enhanced separate brigades. It was the lower resource units uh, that were sent uh, to Europe to, to provide force protection. And then as we picked up a larger load in the Balkans with S-4 and K-4, uh, we sent our divisional units 
in order to uh, to maintain uh, the higher enhanced units uh, for whatever contingency uh, came later. So what we found is our tiered readiness uh, strategy really wasn't uh, conducive to a persistent conflict and did not meet the demand of uh, of the warfighter. So as we as we looked at that, so what did we do in these managed levels of, of resources? First, uh, we we've been required to do an extensive level of cross leveling uh, between units that were not going uh, to units that that were going, and so that provides a tremendous amount of, of turbulence. It also uh, degrades the cohesiveness of an organization when in the last months prior to mobilization you're moving soldiers from one unit in which they had trained and, and developed relationships into another unit to where they maybe did not know anybody. Uh, we pushed around equipment from those that had it to those that were going next. Uh, we adjusted uh, resourcing levels uh, primarily due to OCO to bring units that maybe didn't have the resources to train at the levels uh, provided or maybe didn't have the full-time uh, support uh, required in pre-mobilization to reach the level of readiness prior to mobilization to achieve uh, the the boots on time uh, boots on ground time that we were looking for and so we had that had to push that around and, and then the other thing that changed is rather than, than focusing on on the C ratings we started to focus on a unit's ability to meet the mission uh, to which they were assigned so we found is the USR and, and unit status reports were starting to become irrelevant to some degree because they were based on a full spectrum uh, metal that maybe the unit, in many cases, the unit was not gonna be asked to do when they went into the, uh, into the combat zone or, or into one of the other contingency operations. So we really started to focus the man equipped train to a specific requirement that didn't relate to a, a readiness level. So as we moved in and we looked at how we could support the Army in our, in our position of 1-5-25, uh, one division, five brigades, and 25 uh, K and enablers, how do we get there? And we found the two key elements for us to be successful as a reserve component in all volunteer, voluntary environment uh, is what we call the, the two piece, predictability and then precision. Uh, the Army Force Generation Model is truly the tool in which the Army is being able to provide our reserve component uh, soldiers that predictability and then the Army Guard as an organization, the precision uh, to intensely manage those resources required to ensure readiness and hitting the aim points as we move through the Army Force Generation Model. Uh, predictability is key for our soldiers, for our families, and for our employers. Uh, what we found is, is we can recruit and we can retain soldiers and families and, and keep our soldiers employed if we provide them all the predictability to know when the soldier would not be available uh, at their place of employment and provided families the understanding of, of uh, the commitment that our soldiers were making. And then as I said, precision was key in requirements, uh, resourcing, and then missions as we try to use uh, that, that ever important uh, fund dollar to reach the level, the highest level of readiness we can in pre-mobilization and then uh, off to post-mobilization. Uh, honestly, uh, without Arfrogen, it would be really almost impossible, at least to say difficult, to ensure that we provided forces command uh, with soldiers, ready soldiers and units uh, at the mobilization date. Uh, another important point, General Graham mentioned it, uh, was the conferences that ForceCom has, has provided us uh, and our aiming points. What that's enabled us to do is start to hone that precision that is required to ensure those ready uh, units and, and soldiers. Uh, we know in many cases 24 months to 18 months ahead of time of the mission a unit will be performing and it can make all the difference in the world as we, we generate uh, that readiness and we assign soldiers and we make sure the net debt new equipment and displaced equipment training is completed so that when the unit begins to do its collective level training it has a cohesive team that they've built and they're able to do that collective training together and they don't have soldiers that are off doing individual training preparing or uh, that we're trying to, uh, to fill holes later than we need to and particularly as you look at some of the the 
high demand, low density MOSs, uh, special forces, aviation, military intelligence. It becomes even more critical when it takes you two years to train and develop uh, an individual for that mission. So the earlier you know that a unit needs to go, the, the more chance of success that you have. So as we look at r for gen it's truly the synchronization tool that synchronizes people, equipment, and training. People, it helps us focus on when to recruit for a unit, uh, to execute the individual training, to get them ready for the collective training. Helps us retain our soldiers, and then it helps us develop them as leaders as they move through r for gen equipment. Uh, it's critical to the fielding of equipment, to the modernization and then ensuring that when a unit enters the available pool, whether it's a DEF or a CEF, or when it comes to our Title 32 mission, the, cruel, uh, the critical dual-use dual uh, equipment uh, to make sure that uh, the force that is in the, the available pool has its equipment uh, as it's been, been tasked, whether it's a DEF or a CEF, and then if it's back in the state, it has those pieces of key equipment that are important to emergency uh, response. And finally, under training, uh, the collective level of proficiency. It helps us focus and hone the training uh, because in the limited amount of time that we have in pre-mobilization for our Army Guard soldiers, if we can focus and get to those critical tasks required uh, to, to validate before you go overseas, and, and the more opportunity our soldiers get to practice those key tasks, the better off they are. And, and really what it does is, is it ensures, us, ensures our ability to have ready units for the combatant commanders in our role of Title 10 and then for the governors in our Title 32 role. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And with, with that, that's um, what we had prepared at least to, to get the discussion started. And uh, what we'd like to do now is open up for you all for questions or comments um, about this or other matters related to readiness. Oh, thank you very much. Go ahead, sir. Yes, we have. And the one thing I would say is that all, all services, not just in the American military, but in, in, um, in our allies as well, all of them do combine a degree of individual rotation with unit rotation. And the question is sort of how is your, how is your force leaning in terms of the bulk of its effort? Um, we did settle at brigade, but I would tell you that uh, you raise a really interesting point, which is what, where, is the, where is the best point to rotate? Um, right now we're set for brigades, but I will tell you, I know it's going to get looked at. And to, and to be honest, we set early on brigades because that's what the requirement was, and that's how we were um, modifying our force. So as the forces changed, they were coming out in the new configuration in brigade sets. I think as we, as we reduce in terms of the amount of demand overseas, and we can really get to 1 to 2, 1 to 4, 1 to 3, 1 to 5, an experiment where we'd look at other alternatives would, would really be worthwhile, and I, I think you're right. And, and, but I, I should mention, there's, there's elements of our force that are still on individual rotation. For example, if you were to look in General Petraeus's headquarters for the International Security Assistance Force, which is a combined headquarters, it's got NATO forces and some other allies as well besides Americans, those people are filling as individuals. Um, and there's going to be some degree of individual rotation. And there's other elements like that, some of the advisory elements and, and uh, some of the provincial reconstruction teams. Uh, have more of an individual flavor to their rotation. But you, you raise a great point. You know, what's the right level to do it? Uh, brigades has served as a good forcing function, but I think as we, as we slow down our demand a little bit, um, we have an opportunity to look and see if there's another alternative. Yeah, that's a good point. What else? Yes, sir.
Okay, I, I would challenge one comment you made, and that is that R4Gen is a today thing. Actually, if R4Gen is done right, it provides the space for you to look toward tomorrow because you go on a rotational readiness, and some of your force then is not in the fight. Um, until now, frankly, as mentioned, we've been pretty much either in the fight or between the fight. Um, what R4Gen will do is allow us that space to begin looking toward a future force, and, and a comment like made earlier, maybe we want to go to a battalion rotation. Maybe we have to look at the composition and mix of our force, not just between components, active guard and reserve, but also in terms of structure. You know, do we have the right proportion of heavy forces versus uh, elements that are medium weight, like our striker forces, elements that are lightweight? How better could we integrate Army aviation or emergent technologies for targeting and information technology? Um, until now, we haven't really had that capability, but one thing that's emerged, interesting enough, you heard um, General Graham, Mark Graham, talk about CEF forces. We actually will have one of our CEF brigades the, um, that's down at Fort Bliss that's going to be designated to do experiment, experimentation and to look at potential future forces. This is not new for the American Army. We've done this before. Um, those of you in the room may remember the, the tri triple capability experiments after Vietnam with the first CAV, the, the master program, the digitization programs that were done with 4th Infantry Division. There's been other experimental forces before, the high technology uh, test bed out at uh, 9th Infantry Division Fort Lewis, the light infantry division initiatives at several posts, most notably Fort Ord. Um, so we've got a, a tradition of doing this going all the way back, you know, to before the S Second World War with the Lu Louisiana and Carolina Tennessee maneuvers. Um, but I think what R4Gen done right will do is give us some forces that can drop off, as General Graham said, the conveyor belt and check out some other ways that we can do business. We really, in the middle of this one, um, we reorganized our forces in that brief time they were home between rotations. And I think most of us in this room would agree that although we have modular formations, there's a lot of challenges with those. I mean, from my point of view, I would argue that, that two maneuver battalions is not an optimal set for a brigade combat team, two maneuver battalions and a cavalry squadron. Um, two firing batteries is not optimal for an artillery battalion. Um, some of the way we've integrated our aviation is not op optimal. It's been good as far as getting forces in the fight, but it, we've got to get to that, to that. And I think what General Graham said was really important, and that is, once you get to a sustainable rate of one to two, one to four, you have the capability to train for full spectrum operations. You know, Mark referred to one unit, which today is the 2nd Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division, training at Fort, at, at Fort uh, Polk, Louisiana in the Joint Readiness Training Center. Of your complete 1.1 million soldier army, all components, we have one brigade combat team that we're able to devote to full spectrum operations today. That will expand as we begin to withdraw forces from Iraq, but it gives you an idea of how close to the margin we are in the current fight and why rotational readiness is really important to get, get some of us back just a little bit to look at things beyond a counterinsurgency campaign in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. A anything, Mark, on that? That's right. I, I think we are um, we're maintaining the combat edge. One is because you're able to focus your, your manning and your equipment on those forces, on a smaller amount of forces as they come through. Imagine, you know, we use the analogy of the, remember the old ALO? The ALO levels, ALO one through eight. You know, if you were if you were an ALO one unit, you were always ready to go, everybody liked to be in that unit. If you were an ALO eight unit, life wasn't so good for you. But if you take that, if you take that ALO one through eight and you stand it up like this, one is here, eight is here, what our 4 gen does is it does this. Now every unit will get to go through that process. So you are maintaining a combat edge, not only in these units over here that are the most, they're the best manned, equipped, and trained units, but also what you're doing is you're building the overall experience of the force as they move from unit to unit. No longer, if you just keep going to the same lower level rated units, you know, you're, you're thinking that's the way life is. Now you'll know, because that unit's gonna eventually come up through the process. So I think we do, not only do we maintain an edge, but we're able to see ourselves better, uh, which tells us where, where's, the, where's the edge a little dull and we need to sharpen the edge. CT-centric force, um, because as we move readiness to combat teams, 
for defined requirements of assigned missions in the theater, it's very easy to take them to a training model to meet that. As we go back to FSO, and I'm seeing this very, very clearly with our third brigade rotation at GRTC, I, I, it may not sound popular in some regards, but mm -hmm. there becomes a TRA initiative that the stability of a division headquarters now has to train those brigades at different increments in time as they move through the R4 jet model to produce readiness. Otherwise, you, you leave it incumbent upon brigades as they rotate through. And then combatant commanders that say, wait for that capability to arrive, could get a mixed bag. Right. Um, yes, it could be assigned to their FSO medal and they could do those things, but right now, one of the things I'm experiencing in this thing is, is how do you inject the division headquarters over top of TRA as you move brigades to R4 Gen? And oh, by the way, division headquarters are still going back and forth. Yeah. But it's that standardization in the training model that I think is somewhat missing as we have become focused on division or brigades right. going into the fight for the, the coin. Yeah, and, and if I could, sir, uh, and, and Jim, Roger, and the good news is we recognize that. And that's why you heard me talk about the Rubik's Cube and lining them back up. It will take two to three years to fix this. I mean, we've been sending out units at dog team level, platoon, company, and battalion. We've got, we've got company commanders and logistics units who have had four different battalion commanders during their company command tour. I mean, so we've, we've kind of we got some leader development challenges here because of that, and we're putting that back together again. Uh, and, and that is why we're going through, and we're learning a lot of lessons, by, by the way. I was just down at JRTC this last week, too, and learned a lot of lessons here, which is, which is exactly why we needed to do this. Uh, now, our, our first full-spectrum rotation for a striker unit will be in August of 11 at NTC. That will be, uh, that'll be a learning experience as well. But, but we, you, the good news is we've recognized we got the challenge. Now we can move forward with it. But, no, you're exactly right. I, I think the other thing, and, and Jim also corrected me, it's the 3rd Brigade 82nd. 2nd Brigade 82nd is coming off Global Response Force. They were our previous unit. They never got the classic full-spectrum rotation that 3rd Brigade is getting. But um, Jim raised a great point, and that is modular force that's, that's done by brigades is also it's built to a fixed design. Um, the division commander, in, in the case of General Jim Huggins, who commands the 82nd Airborne, the only elements that he has to wait the fight, he has to either pull from another brigade, he has aviation, he has an aviation brigade, and he has a division headquarters, and, and we know how happy most brigades are to see the division headquarters show up to wait their fight. And, um, and so the, the fact of the matter is the old style division had engineers, had sustainment capabilities, air defense, artillery that could be shifted to, to wait the main effort. This is one of the things that, back to the great, very good question over here about building our combat edge, this is one of the things we got to look at. Because our force right now is modular and BCT, but it's also fixed. And does this make sense as we go into different kinds of conflict? When you're fighting against a guy whose primary weapon is a roadside bomb and an AK-47, it's probably fine. If you begin to fight an enemy, and there are enemies out in the world who have formed forces who have, uh, who have tanks and surface-to-air missiles and things like that, you're going to have to look at a different structure. And our structure has sufficient flexibility in it, but what's going to happen if we don't train to that, what will happen over time, you've got younger generations of folks coming in whose only knowledge of that is from theoretical map exercises at Fort Benning or Fort Sill, and we've got to get past that. As you all know, as we gather here today, and there's, there's men and women in this room who fit this category, We've, been, we've brought in whole categories. There are platoon sergeants in the United States Army who've never known any world other than the world of counterinsurgency. We, you know, one of the other things that Jim Huggins is doing that he mentioned that's typical of, of what we're trying to do to get back to full spectrum operations is the very important forcible entry mission. The, the capability that as, as you go to sleep every night that the president believes he has to pick up a red telephone and launch a division ready brigade from the 82nd anywhere in the world where our aircraft can reach. The fact of the matter is that capability has got to be exercised routinely. And, and in fact, in many cases, it has not been exercised as routinely as it used to. And I would put in that same category the ability to mass fires from, from cannons, multiple rocket launchers, and aircraft. All those things are theoretically possible, but we have not done a lot of that in the last year. It's been very disaggregated, and over the last five or six years, it's been very much a squad and platoon fight. We're doing a great job at that. But we should not kid ourselves that that alone will bring us full spectrum capability. Yes, sir, I'd like to add one yeah. thing to what General Huggins said. You know, as we worked with the modular force, General Huggins Division headquarters may end up in Afghanistan. And 